Hey guys, Ken here. Um, welcome to the first online course for visual identity. Now, I'm new to this. I mean, I've done a lot of tutorials, online tutorials and stuff, but for the most part, um, teaching online is something that I can modify, change, go back, redo. And because of the schedule, I'm kind of limited on how many changes I can make. So bear with me. Hopefully, um, the, the videos will be informative. If we have to go to an actual online course where I'm teaching while you guys are watching, we'll do that. Um, in fact, I'm going to try that in another class, um, a YouTube online class. Um, or not a class, but one class will be a YouTube online. I'm going to t test that out, see how that works. And we may move to that later on in the, the semester maybe even next week or next class if it works well. Um, so bear with me. I might make some mistakes. Um, in fact, I'll guarantee that I'll make some mistakes. But we have to keep moving. The semester is winding down, and we have a lot of work to take care of. So for visual identity, you guys have finished the first step in creating your, your visual identity manual, and that was defining the logo. That is typically the hardest part. The next part is defining how that logo is used. Now this is pretty much all up to you. Um, there's no, I, I am going to critique and I'm going to say certain things about your color palette and, and, and some aesthetic choices. But for the most part, the, the, the items that were critiqued by the client, in this case the keeping room, that's over. Next, uh, since she has given you the okay on the logo that you were working on, that next you take it to that next level and you define all the parameters that make it um, work in all the different situations that you might run into. So I'm going to go over what I would expect you guys to be working on. Um, I'm not sure um, by the end of the video or by announcement I may have a deadline for some of this or all of it. Depending on how much time you have, depending on what your other courses are, it could be that you could get this done by next class. But I haven't decided for sure how that's going to uh, transpire. All right. So as I mentioned, um, the first step was the visual identity manual was to create a logo that passed the client's test. I went over this definition before, and I've, I've online there's all sorts of different definitions. I think this one is at, adequate for us. What is a visual identity and graphic standards policy? Well, it's a visual identity guide provides specific guidelines and standards for the keeping room and its implementation of the keeping room's visual identity and graphic standards system in all forms of business communication. Now, that last part is important because all forms of business communication means letterhead, website, um, TV, if she decides to um, make advertisements, billboards, anything that you can think of that she would be using for the keeping room needs to be taken into consideration. Now when it comes to television, that's digital and same with web. So we would kind of say that digital viewing of the logo would be a certain way. Okay, um, I hope that makes sense, but you have to figure out all the different ways that this logo would be used, and then you have to define it, professionally define it, in the way that you would expect it to be used. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, and I'm going to give you some examples. Um, the one example that I'm using is, um, I'm actually going to put it up on Blackboard, but I'll show you um, pretty much what I'm following. All right, um, remember that the Visual Identity Manual is a book or a booklet, all right? Now, that's important. To, um, I'm, I'm worried that some people are going to say, well, you know, I'll just write this stuff up and it's not that big of a deal. No, this is a booklet. This is something that is a finished product that could go on somebody's bookshelf. Now, in our situation, we won't be printing it out because you don't have facilities and because of the situation we're in with uh, uh, COVID-19, or COVID-19, um, you won't be making a physical book, but it needs to be professionally done. It needs 
all the, the attention to detail that I would expect if it were to be printed. Okay, so the, remember the, the Visual Identity Manual is a book or booklet that gives anyone interested in using the business's logo or identity guidelines for use. I want to make sure that you understand that this is a book with many pages and with written text. The text is just as important as the graphics that you use. Be clear and concise, use proper grammar, and make sure that you check your spelling through several different methods. Now those methods are up to you, but I would say don't just rely on one. Don't rely on two. Do as many as you possibly can um, think of. Some examples are Microsoft Word, InDesign, and having somebody else read it for you, looking for any errors that you might have. The layout of the manual also matters as well. Your margins, where do you put those, the space at the, the side? What about the page numbers down at the bottom? Um, the typeface choice, the spacing all need to be accounted for as a designer. Don't use default anything. Create styles to ensure that there isn't any chance that you'll miss something. And what I mean by styles is uh, in uh, intro to graphic design, I showed you in InDesign how to create a style. Now, it's tempting to ignore that because it's an extra step, and a lot of people will, will kind of, you know, I did this probably for the first five years I was designing. I would just go in and design everything the way I wanted. If I wanted Helvetica, I would select the text and change it to Helvetica 12 or 13 or whatever I wanted. Over time, I've realized that I used to make mistakes. There would be, I'd go in and make a change to something, and it wouldn't be the same typeface. Or, um, say it, it was close, but it was 12 points instead of 11.5. The only way that you're going to minimize that, that risk is by creating styles. So re if you can't remember how to do styles, um, look it up online or ask me. I will show you how to do it. In fact, I plan on doing um, more of a how-to, like a, a tutorial, online tutorial on creating a booklet and all the different nuances. I know the vast majority of you um, already have done something similar in the past, but there are at least, I think, four people that have, haven't yet. So I want to make sure that to remind what we learned in uh, Intro to Graphic Design. Um, use only in design. Make sure. You can't use Microsoft Word. You can use Microsoft Word to spell check. I do that all the time. Um, it's great at grammar and it's great at spell checking, but when it comes to designing, you have to pick a professional uh, uh, program. InDesign is that one. All right, so now we're going to get to the second step. And well, let me see if I can get to it. Okay, the second step is to professionally define define your logo and to establish the color palette for the keeping room. All right, now I didn't have, I think one student actually uh, chose the colors and I talked about the Pantone booklet and I told you that um, nowadays the Pantone colors are online and you can find them in Photoshop. Um, but I need you to be able to um, work with color when it comes to uh, this design manual. All right. Three colors minimum, but you can have up to five. I wouldn't expect you to have five. I kind of think that you might struggle to come up with three, but I want you for if you have a background to your logo or um, you know you use it in different situations. For example, you're going to have just a black one, right? You're going to have uh, probably one that color of, that you think would look the best. It could be a maroon color. It could be anything, but I need up to three. I, and those three colors need to be listed by RGB, by CMYK, by hex, and by Pantone. And what you would do is you would do a small box. Um, you, how you do the layout is up to you, but you would show a sample of the color, and you would say this is um, Pantone 1402 hex um, hash sign 00075. Um, what's some other ones? Uh, RGB, red green, blue, and you would break it down that way. So, so if anybody was interested in using one of your colors, they have every possible method that, you know, t there's other ways too, but, but 
the, the most common ways that people are going to be um, accessing the color listed for them. You would do this for all of your colors. If you have three colors, then you would separate them. You would have a swatch. Now that swatch would be small. It doesn't, I don't, I don't want like a huge swatch, half the size of the page, and then you list it out this way. But I would expect it's just a small little thing, maybe um, a half an inch by a half an inch, and, and then list that information. You should show your logo in the color that you choose and place examples of the logo in the colors. So you would have a swatch. Maybe you would show, and how you do the layout is up to you. Okay, I'm gonna show you a sample from, um, I think, Queens University. Um, but you could put the logo in the color that you're, one of your colors that you chose. And then you could list underneath um, the RGB, CMYK, hex, and uh, Pantone colors, numbers, all right? And you can do that for the three colors across one row of your um, layout. Once you've got the colors picked out, now you need to go in and actually define the logo so that anybody can use it. Now remember, this isn't just graphic designers. If we were to, to deal with uh, Peru State and we were doing a poster, or no, not, not us. Imagine that there's an there's a administrative assistant sitting in an office and she has been told or asked to do a newsletter. She's not a graphic designer. She doesn't know all the nuances and all those special things, but she has a digital um, or a, a design manual that will explain those things to her. And it has to be in a way that she would understand it. For example, you know how, if, if you had classes with me before in Illustrator, I told you never just to grab the bounding box to increase text. It's because of the ratio. We need to constrain the size of the text. Those are the type of things that, that need to be considered. With, um, with when you define the, the, the dimensions and all the, the other stuff, you need to um, define the logo size by width and height depending on its aspect ratio, both by inches and by pixels. Remember that, that the logo could be used for the web or it could be used for um, uh, print. So imagine you always pretty much, when it comes to print, probably what you want to do is 300 dpi. Now you could show um, uh, 150 DPI as well, dots per inch, but by inches, the minimum you would go is one. Now, if you have a long logo, the keeping room, then maybe it's the height that you want to make sure that it never goes below, like it never needs to go below, say, um, a half inch, or you could do the length, it never be um, shorter than, say, two inches. You need to define those. And remember, the logo is going to go on envelopes. It's going to go on packing slips. It's going to go on all sorts of different things. So you can't just say, well, it looks best at five inches, and I'm going to say that the, the minimum is five inches. You have to drop it down probably, I mean, the guideline is one inch. And it could be one inch height, but um, I pushed you guys to do one inch in width. Okay. So define your minimum logo size, and let's go to the next page. You need to state your typeface. You need to tell that person that's over, you know, doesn't know anything about, about design, um, what typeface did you use? If it's proprietary, meaning you paid for it, then there's going to be um, issues there, meaning that they can't use that. So you have to give them images that they can use. Um, make sure to be specific. If you used Helvetica Light, say Helvetica Light. If you used um, uh, Helvetica Bold, state that. And it's not just that, it's all the other things. If you increase the tracking, decrease the tracking. If you um, kern something, there's a, well, kerning is something a little bit different. I, I don't, you don't need to list that, but the tracking you do. Um, 
give any information about implementation of the logo that is relevant, such as is, is there white space that you have to have around it? You might say a minimum of one inch, and I have a sample of this coming up, say one inch border around the logo. That anything that impedes in that area is going to minimize the effect of the logo. So you want to state that there has to be a certain amount of white space or um, that there doesn't need to be any white space. Just make sure that you state it. Um, give, um, are there any colors in the background? If not, then state that, that in your manual. Are you going to use a black field? Is, can a black field be used and to reverse the text into white? That's a, that's a possibility. And you might show samples of that. If, for example, say your main color is a maroon color and you want to put your, your um, make a maroon background, the text has to be white, right? Um, but maybe you have a second color where there's yellow. Show both of those and show how it would look. Um, okay, so that's what I want you to be working on. Now, I didn't go into the details of writing it, but understand that the writing part is just as important. It's actually more important now that you've finished the logo. Understanding the things that you have to include in the manual is very important as well, but the writing part of it is, is very important. Okay, so now I want to show you a sample of uh, the, the visual identity manual that I'm using um, for the class. And the reason why I'm, I picked one is that you have a reference. This is what I'm going on. This is what I'm basing this information on is Queen's University. If you want to move forward, and I suggest that you do, because we are going to be pushed for time. I'm going to be pushing you every week to get something else done. Um, you can. There's no, there's no limit to what you want to do. If you're bored, sitting home, tired of watching TV, um, you know, go ahead and work all the way through it. All right. All right, so I chose Queen's University for a visual identity guide. It's, um, you can get it online, but I'm gonna put it up on Blackboard as well. And re like I said, the reason why I did that is I want you to have hands on. I want you to be able to say, I don't get what he was saying. I don't quite understand that what he meant about the size or, or the white space. And I'm basically just going down the line here and stating what they did and what I required that you do. Now there are certain things that I'm uh, leaving out, but there are certain things that I'm passing by right now, and then I'm going to go back and say, all right, now you need a, a forward, you need an introduction, you need a cover, you need all these things. So um, as we move forward, you'll see that, that I do skip certain things, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. All right. Um, I'm going to skip down roughly to I'm going to go to the next page here. All right, the first thing that I want you to be aware of is that this is designed. Notice how they're interacting with the viewer. They've broken it down by um, the, the logo itself and then the word mark, which is a logo type, separate. They're doing very nice type of designs. They've got little notes on the side um, and then they give the basic understanding about it. Notice that the Queen's logo appears below. It is the primary element of the Queen's visual identity system and must appear on all official Queen's pro, uh, communications. It may not be modified in any way. The Queen's logo is the pref preferred visual representation for the university and will be provided in formats appropriate to usage needs. And that is key. This is what you're going to do. Imagine that it says the keeping room. This is, would all be relevant. This is exactly what I want you to think about. 
What you're doing is you're designing um, a layout that's going to give the information how the Keeping Rooms logo is going to be used. Okay? Notice how it's designed. They've got it kind of separated here. There's kind of like a title, the logo. Now they break it down different ways. Now none of you are doing coat of arms and some of you are doing logos, um, actual logos, but most of you are doing logo types. And so um, you, you'd be fine with um, not having something like this, but down here where the word mark, this is where you would come into play. This is what you need to um, work on. And notice that it's all written. It talks about it. It's the use of the word Queens in uh, the official Queens type is freely permitted in written communication. It gives all the possibilities of how it could be used. Okay? Now, I, I want to stress it is about writing. You have to write. When we get to the logo, the proportions. Now, some of you haven't gotten to this detail. But once you finish, now imagine that this was the keeping room, and you have your logo finished, right? You break it down, you take it into Illustrator, you look at it and say, all right, well, I've got a logo here of a wine glass. And that takes up 20% of the logo type. So that needs to be um, relayed in there, OK? You need to state that in it. You'll notice that it has the, the breakdown of the, the spacing, where the center line is. This is 30% of this. It gives a little bit of information here. The logo is designed to ensure that the width of the coat of arms is always 30% of the entire width of the word Queens. For them, that's very important. And for you, if you're working with the, the keeping room, that's just as important. All right, and then they, they write about all the, all the information. So it's not just facts. Then they go through and they show not how they talk about not doing certain things. Size restrictions. For printed materials, the Queen's logo mark must never be smaller than one inch. For digital use, the Queen's logo must never be smaller than 100 pixels wide. Reproduction of the logo in sizes smaller than this will reduce the logo's impact and make it unclear for general usage. Now they go in and they did one, uh, they broke it down by 6P, but one inch, you don't have to do it by piece, um, and 100 pixels. Now I want you to consider that's 300 DPI and um, break it down like that. Now here's an example of white space. They call it the clear zone. Now you can call it the clear zone as well, or you can say required white space, however you want to label it. As long as it's clear, that what you're talking about is the space around the logo that must not be used or that it can be used. Um, here, the area indicated blue, the clear zone must be kept free of graphics, typography, competing backgrounds, or the edge of a printed piece, computer screen, i.e. margins. Okay, so, so basically, if you were to put this on a, on a page, you couldn't just jam it right up against the top, right? Because if it was a print, that margin, there wouldn't be that white space at the top of it. If you put it all the way to the side, say you were doing uh, an envelope, and you put it all the way over, then that would be wrong. It states all the information. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I encourage you to spend the time to read it and to understand it. I can answer questions about it um, in next class, in class, in our discussion. I hope that you will ask questions. I'll do my best to answer them as I can, all right? But notice that they've got the bottom, the top, the left, or the right, and the left, all, take, all accounted for. And then we get into colors. Now you notice that they have three colors. And notice how they broke it down into like a table. 
It's very neat, it's concise, it lets you understand the, the differences between them. For example, um, we have for prints, Pantone colors. But if it wasn't going Pantone, then it would go for color process, and that's uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And then for digital web video, um, we have RGB and we have uh, hexadecimal. Hexadecimal, I don't, this is wrong. It shouldn't be HTML, it should be hexadecimal. Um, um, logo files. Now, you don't necessarily have to put that in, um, but you can state the JPEG, PNGs, the different C. We have 300 PPI, which is DPI, um, and that's two inches wide, two inches wide, and then one inch illustrator. Um, and it, there's no resolution. It is scalable, meaning that in, remember how I said that it's vector-based? You can resize it and everything stays perfect. So it's not, it, it is scalable. Again, the colors over here. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to go over. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I want you to show the different colors that, um, you, you are, that the logo would look in your palette. Okay? Now, if we were to go back up here, we have the three colors plus black. We have uh, red, yellow, and blue right here. And if we go down here, you'll see um, that they're using the colors to show um, the way that it can be used. Now, I don't see yellow in any of these. But um, we have blue, red, and black. They go through single or two color reproduction. Now, you don't have to, if, if you, you're showing the colors that it's okay to use. Now, if your palette is for background, foreground, um, for the logo, it's all the different things. Not all of those colors are required to show in, in here. For example, if your background is going to be black. Well, no, that, that's a bad example. Um, let's say that you have yellow as your background, but you don't want the logo to be printed in yellow. So you wouldn't put that up here. Just the colors that you would expect. Now notice that they show do not do this. Um, they, they talk about on light background colors, the black logo can be used. Contrast must be maintained. These are some of the examples of that being used. These are the colors that can be used. Remember, black always has to be in, in uh, uh, accounted for. You always have to have black. The other colors, um, that's up to you. Um, notice that they state right here, Queen's Gold is not an option for single or two color print jobs. So like for example, some people would say uh, I'm doing a booklet and I'm just going to use the, the gold color of the school this way. And the manual says, no, 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 you cannot do that. And the reason why I point that out is because that's the kind of stuff that you need to include in your, your manual yourself. There are, you have to think it out. You have to, you know, what, what is the worst case scenario and the best case scenario? You decide what the best case scenario is. And then you have to put, you have to think of what somebody might do that would destroy your logo and you need to write about that. Reverse color reproduction. When you're using a, a field in the background and you're using just white, what colors are, are acceptable? Here, they're saying that the contrast isn't high enough to use it, but these colors are acceptable. And then they get into color applications, incor uh, incorrect usage. I'm not going to 
ask that you do this quite yet. I need you to work on the correct way to use it. And then maybe next week we'll, we'll define how to figure out what's the incorrect way to use it. Now, I'm hoping that this um, video is helping you. And I actually really hope that there isn't any problem with the video. I'm going to shut this down, go check it, and hopefully everything is OK. And I will upload it on YouTube shortly. Um, remember that after this video, or at our normal time frame of class, which is 1.45 to 3.30, I think, um, you have to be online on Blackboard. Make sure that you're there, um, especially for this first week. This first week is very important. And I'll make an announcement in, in Blackboard as well. I need to, oops, lights just went off. Sorry about that. Um, this first week is very important because um, we need to account for every student. If a student isn't responding to the class, meaning they aren't showing up for the class, they haven't asked questions, they aren't doing anything, then we don't know if there's a problem with the student getting online. For all we know, the student doesn't, doesn't have internet. So for the first um, week, I need to make sure that everybody is online. Depends on how we do it. We may do, um, I think Blackboard is the safest way f at first, but I really would like to go live with um, YouTube Live. I think that would be the best way. But at this point, um, I want to make sure that everybody can log in and there's no problems. So we're going to have a discussion about this lecture. Let me know, um, have some questions for me. Anything that I can answer, I will answer. If I can't answer it then, then I will get back to you. Okay? Thank you, guys. Um, stay safe, and I will talk to you in the discussion. Bye.